at $299.99. Turbo Duo is the ultimate machine with the ultimate game offer. Two free CDs and a Turbo Chip game, five separate games at a value of $250. And you won't believe what's included. Hello everyone and welcome back to the last part of the Ultimate Turbo Duo review. In this video, I am going to finish up looking at the final games released for the system. By the end, they were all being released on the Super CD-ROM 2 format. There were no more Hue card games released towards the end of the system's life cycle. So we're just going to pick up where we left off on the last video and finish up with the games. Lords of Thunder is a shoot-em-up game by Hudson Soft and Red Company for the Turbo CD. It was released in 1993, and was later ported to the Sega CD in 1995. I already reviewed this game when I did the Sega CD review, but just to recap, in this game you play as the legendary knight Duran as you set off to defeat an evil god and his generals who have taken over the world. The order at which you take on the different generals is up to you, as well as the strategy on which suit of armor you will use. As with the Sega CD version, one of the biggest draws of this game, to me, is the game's killer heavy metal soundtrack. This game does take advantage of the expanded RAM included in the Super CD-ROM 2, allowing for more vibrant colors and varied enemy types. Something I found interesting while researching this game is that, when it was first released on the Turbo Duo, it was very well received, but by the time it came out for the Sega CD in 95, reviews had softened a bit, saying the game looked very dated. However, in more modern reviews, this game is looked upon in a much better light, with even Nintendo Life Magazine giving the reissue on the Virtual Console a 9 out of 10. I have to say, this is one of the best games on the Turbo Duo, in my opinion. I definitely enjoy it. I can't recommend it enough. It is such a hidden gem that I think everyone should get it on this system, even though it has a high price tag. Might and Magic 3, Isles of Terra, is a third-person role-playing video game in the series of Might and Magic. This game was originally released for PCs in 1991, and was ported over to the Turbo Duo probably because PCs, again, were very expensive back in the day, especially with a CD-ROM drive. 
And I'm just going to be quite honest here and tell you that I am not as familiar with the Might and Magic series, at least some of these early games, as I should be in order to give this game a proper review. The only thing I can say is that I think the graphics on this system look good. I would say a step above Dungeon Master, but this game, in terms of gameplay, actually kind of reminds me a lot of that. Seems like it's turn-based, but it is incredibly difficult right at the beginning, so I didn't end up getting very far in it. One thing I will say is that this is one of those games that really makes me wish there was a mouse for this system because I do find hovering over the controls a bit more cumbersome with a controller than I would have seen with a mouse. As with Dungeon Master, I don't think that this game lives up or ages as well as other titles from this time period because of how they're showing 3D graphics here. I think fans that grew up with this will find this very nostalgic, but I found it again a little bit frustrating, and needlessly so. And as this is one of the more expensive games to get for the Turbo Duo, I would definitely recommend trying it out on a different platform and not this one. And I have very similar notes here for Sim Earth. It's another game I'm not as familiar with as I haven't played it before. It does look interesting, and I think I would like to give this a shot, but again on a different platform because it is designed for mouse controls, and the controller just makes it needlessly complicated. I feel like Sim Earth, along with Might and Magic, would benefit from having the instruction manual with it, because I don't know what all these icons mean, and there's a lot that is not explained in-game. Luckily, Sim Earth did not break the bank to collect, but I definitely was not as impressed with this title, again, for the same reasons why I wasn't impressed with Might and Magic. Super Arizonk Rockabilly Paradise is a horizontally scrolling shooter developed by Duel and published by Hudson Soft. And this game was a bit surprising to me because I was expecting this to be like Bonk 3, which was just the same game as on the Hue card, but with a CD-ROM soundtrack. However, Super Arizonk is a lot different than regular Arizonk on the Hue card. In fact, it's actually listed as a sequel. And as a sequel, this contains all new levels, assistants, and enemies, as well as a CD quality soundtrack consisting of rockabilly music. One thing I find a bit strange is that the original Airzonk actually had a lot of what looked like multi-layer parallax scrolling, but in Super Airzonk, it's actually a flat background, or single plane background, with a few exceptions. And I'm not quite sure of the reason, because the Turbo Duo was definitely capable of doing more than a regular Hue card would have been. In terms of how this game plays, it's... okay. I'm not gonna say it was the best experience I ever had, in fact, I wasn't really engaged in the gameplay at all, it just seemed kind of tedious and really overall boring to me. Looking at how other game publications rated this game, Electronic Gaming Monthly gave this game a 5 out of 10, commenting that the game has very little action or intensity and is by far way too easy. And that matches up to my experience of why I wasn't too invested into this game. For a platform that has many very good shooters on it, this one just seems mediocre. And I don't think this game sold very well because this is one of the most expensive titles on the system. So I cannot recommend this game in all good conscience because you can get a modern console for what this game cost at the time of this review. Next, we're going to take a look at Sid Mead's Terraforming. Now, I had to pose this question. Were you expecting another side-scrolling shooter, or were you expecting something more like Sim Earth? Gotta be honest, I was not expecting side-scrolling shooter to be the correct answer to that question. 
I guess the name terraforming refers to the game's story, in which the human race has fled to the depths of space after Earth has become uninhabitable. Hmm, kinda like Wally. -E. As a result, they travel from planet to planet in order to find a planet suitable enough to terraform into a new Earth. Along the way, they encounter alien races which they must destroy in an attempt to survive and continue the human race, which to me raises many moral questions. In terms of gameplay, it is a basic side scrolling shooter. You shoot down enemy ships, pick up power-ups and health icons, as well as upgrade your main and secondary weapons, along with each stage ending with a huge boss fight. If you're not sure why this game has Sid Mead's name on it, he was a special effects artist for films such as Star Trek The Motion Picture, Blade Runner, Aliens, and other Hollywood movies, and he was responsible for designing the game's graphics. To which I will say, this game looks stunning. Too bad the gameplay is not as impressive, and most people will never play this game due to the fact that it is hundreds of dollars, if not thousands of dollars, to collect for the Turbo Duo, being one of the most rare games for this system. I would personally give this a 6 out of 10, putting it right in the middle of average, but I've seen reviews go from 7 out of 10 to 2 out of 10. Definitely not the kind of reviews I'd like to see from a game that costs as much as this one does. Moving on to Riot Zone, we are actually moving on to a different genre, one that is not actually represented very well on the system, and that is the beat-em-up. In this game, you take control of one of two characters, no joke, they're named Hawk and Tony. No relation. You decide to go into the Dragon Zone and defeat the crime boss that is there, in order to save a girl, which I'm assuming you have some sort of interest in. And in terms of gameplay, it resembles almost to a T, Final Fight. Once you pick your character, which has some varying abilities, you move from left to right through each level, most of which are split into two or three more scenes, fighting with enemy characters who appear until they reach the confrontation with a stronger boss character at the end of each level. Once you beat the boss, it's on to the next stage. One thing I found a little bit annoying about the gameplay is that enemy characters can move or be thrown outside of the play area, and you have to wait for them to return because you're stuck where you're at, you can't move outside of the screen. Unlike Final Fight, there are no weapons to pick up along the way, but the player can pick up items for points or health. But I think the biggest thing this game is lacking is multiplayer. Yes, this is a single player only game. Overall, I did feel that this game was just okay, again on the average mark. The controls were actually very good, I didn't find myself being stuck in an area because my character wouldn't move, or I couldn't perform a combo. But just to give you an idea of the difficulty, I was able to beat this game on my first time popping it into the system. And I have very little incentive to go back and replay it. Overall, I give this game about a 5 or a 6 out of 10. Again, average, and for a system that is lacking in beat-em-ups, this one may be an option if you're a fan of the genre. As of this review, this game is on the cheaper side, but it still approaches triple-digit figures when you're trying to collect it, so something to be aware of before you decide to invest in this one. And we'll take a brief look here at Camp California. I almost don't know where to begin with this game because it is one of the strangest I have played on this system. I don't know who the audience is for this game. They decided to go ahead and license a bunch of Beach Boys music for the soundtrack, so I can't play any of the music for you or else I get flagged, but I'm not sure why they chose the Beach Boys. Did they have like a resurgence in the 90s that I'm not remembering? Because the rest of this game plays like a very poorly made platformer. Definitely something that was made for kids. Can't say I would recommend this game as a result, and this again is one of the more expensive titles to collect on here, although it's not one of the most expensive. So either way, I would just say skip this one. Lastly brings us to Beyond Shadowgate. 
and this is a classic point-and-click adventure title viewed from a platform perspective. In this game, the player controls Prince Eric, who just returns to his home country to find out about his father's murder, and is framed for it by the minister of the late king, who imprisons him, and then, well, the game starts. And as you can tell from the gameplay footage, I could not figure out how to get out of this dungeon. And sadly, that is my experience with a lot of point-and-click adventures that I did not grow up with. I don't know if as an adult my patience has worn out more thin, or the fact that I have better games to play these days, but this is not one that caught my interest at all. So while I could get out a strategy guide and figure out how to play this game, it's not really going to change my view of it that much. Electronic Gaming Monthly gave this a 7.5 out of 10, criticizing the slow pacing, but praised the eerie mood, graphics, and the intellectually stimulating puzzles, as well as the ability to interact with nearly every item in the game. I didn't find very many modern reviews of this game, and I can see why, because it's very rare and, again, one of the very expensive games for this system. So my recommendation is, go ahead and skip this one. Get in there, you scum! Oh, Eric! Elizabeth! I know you are innocent, my brother. Something evil has befallen the kingdom, and I don't trust Belazar. I keep thinking of poor father. <laughs> I'll have to find a way out of here. As the last of the line of kings, I'll avenge father's death, I swear! Alright, so what are my thoughts on the Turbo Duo console? Well, I gotta tell you, I really enjoyed a lot of the games that were released for the Turbo Duo. There are actually several games on here that were not released for other systems, at least here in North America. And I think that's what attracts me to this system, as I really like going back and playing games that I haven't played before in this 16-bit style. It really takes me back to the days when I was a kid, when I was really excited for the next 16-bit game. And... They're just not making them like these anymore, so even though I get new games today, they don't make me feel like I have that childhood nostalgia connection with them. And even the games that show up on other consoles, they look, play, and sound great on the Turbo Duo. I'm not going to try to compare all of them yet and say if they were better on this system than they were on the other ones, but all I am going to say is that most of the ports were done well enough to where they didn't suffer in their translation to the Turbo Duo, and that's something that I can't say for every other system. So would I recommend the Turbo Duo to everyone else out there today? I mean, honestly, I would. I think this is the ultimate system if you are going to collect for the TurboGrafx-16, this is the one to have. It plays every single game released on Hue Card, CD-ROM, and Super CD-ROM, and it has the least amount of hassle to get it set up. It looks the best on the shelf. It's not big and clunky, although I do kind of like that style when you take a look at that monstrosity that is the TurboGrafx CD add-on. I mean, honestly, I think this is a better package. The only thing that would stop me from recommending this to everyone is its high price. The games for this system are astronomical in terms of collecting value. I mean, I don't think I've seen another system in recent years, except for the GameCube as of this review, where the games have really shot up in price. And it's mostly because this system has a lot of good titles, a lot of hidden gems, and it's rare. It's actually one of those systems where the rare games are good games that people want to play, and that's what's driving the price way up there. The console itself, this is the only one I've come across in the last 20-some years of collecting. The only one. I bought it, and it had issues, too. I also had to pay a high price for it and pay to get it repaired. I could have done the repair work myself, but most likely with my meager skills, I wouldn't have been able to do it in at least the fashion that the professionals could do it, or I could have ended up ruining my system. I mean, that was a huge possibility as well. So as a result of the high price, the maintenance that these consoles need, and the fact that, I mean, honestly, not everyone enjoys games from this style, I can't recommend it to everyone. But if you're on that kind of medium to hardcore game collector and you have the opportunity to collect one of these, I don't think you'll be disappointed. Of course, there is emulation and there are other options that you can use to play these games in more modern consoles and even that mini that was released a couple of years back. And that's what we're going to talk about in the Legacy video, which will conclude the Ultimate Turbo Graphics series of reviews. But for now, that is going to wrap it up for this video. 
Again, I want to thank you all so much for watching this series. If you're interested, I've already done a series like this for the Sega Genesis, as well as its add-ons, the Sega CD and the Sega 32X, and I plan to do more videos like this for the other 16-bit consoles, or at least the 16-bit era of consoles, because the next console I'm going to review in this series is actually not a 16-bit console, but it fits in with this war. Stay tuned for that coming out to you real soon. Also, I'd recommend checking out my 8-Bit War series if you like this kind of video, because I did the same thing for the Nintendo Entertainment System, the Sega Master System, and the Atari 7800, and I had them face off to see which one was better. And that series is complete in its entirety and available right now. But for now, as I wrap things up, I do want to remember to say, if you like what you see, please click that like button down below, leave a comment about today's video, let me know what you liked about it. Also, let me know what games you like for this system, if you have any experience with it, or which ones you would like to play. Again, I want to thank you all so much for watching. Stay tuned because I have more content coming, and I will see you all in the next one. If you like this video and you'd like to help out with future projects on this channel, please consider supporting me on Patreon. Also, if you enjoy the content of this channel, please remember to click on this subscribe button. Again, I want to thank you so much for watching. I'll see you next time.